able to make the session today. Oh, I see that there. Thanks, Jody. Um, so for folks who I haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Glenn Davis, and I'm the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. And we're really excited to be welcoming some of our colleagues and guests from uh, ACUE, uh, who are going to be talking a bit about this initiative, this effective teaching practices opportunity that you all read about this week. I'm really glad that you had a chance to join us today for this session. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about any next steps, or if you have questions uh, about what this initiative might look like for you, we'll be able to answer some of those today. Um, our colleagues from AQ on the AQ side, and then um, Chelsea and I on our side. So before uh, I introduce our guests, I would like to introduce Chelsea Chandler, Dr. Chelsea Chandler, who is our new Associate Director of the Center for Faculty Excellence. I know that uh, she's relatively new to campus and may not have had a chance to meet you. So Chelsea, maybe you'd like to just say a quick hello. Or not Hi, so everyone. quick. <laughs> no, it, it can be quick. I want to get to the, the main point of this, um, but uh, I'm glad to see all of these faces and I look forward to working with all of you. Um, my role with AQ will be helping to facilitate um, the, the courses that are happening. Um, so if you happen to be interested, you'll get to work a little bit more with CFE and, and with me throughout the process. Um, so I'm excited to see what you all think about this and I hope that you all are able to participate. Great. Well, thanks, Chelsea. And then I'll, I'll just introduce um, some of our guests. We're joined by, I believe, three colleagues, uh, three folks from AQ. Um, Jody Robson, who's going to be uh, primarily presenting today. Is that correct, Jody? Um, also welcoming Marianne Dombrowski and Christine Capello. As well. So welcome to you all, too. And I think with that, we'll turn it over uh, to um, our guests, and we'll have plenty of opportunity for questions throughout the presentation and at the end as well. All right, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Glenn and Chelsea. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started by sharing my screen with all of you. Um, but while I'm going ahead and pulling up my screen, I just wanna say um, I have been in the classroom and I have I come to you with 25 years of experience in education. And um, I know that I had an instructor who early on um, when I went off to college, um, said that we should save our questions to the end of class for the last five minutes. And um, I was like, wow, my question was pertinent at, at the beginning and when I was thinking about it. So I always like to tell everybody when you have a question, please feel free to go ahead and chime in, write it in chat um, or um, raise a hand and I'll finish my statement and I will get to you right away. So I do wanna just make sure everybody knows to go ahead and, and let me know if you have any questions. And I see my colleague Marianne has already posted in the chat. Please go ahead and look at that. She and my co other colleague, Christine, will answer them if they can. If not, they'll go ahead and kick it to me. So um, without further ado, I do wanna go ahead and say that um, I do come to you with 25 years of education experience. Um, and I wanna kind of just give you a little bit of background about me before I get into the presentation. Um, and so you understand the perspective I'm going to share. So um, while I've been in the field of education for 25 years, um, I started in K-12, but my last um, 19 here, and I am from, I'm, I live in Florida, but I'm originally from the Northeast in Pennsylvania. Um, and I have taught as an adjunct instructor at Penn State, and I also did K-12, but my last 17 years here in Florida have been with Indy River State College. Um, I was a full professor for 17 years. Um, my last seven years at my previous institution, I served as our um, director of our Institute for Academics Excellence, which was really kind of our center for teaching and learning. In that capacity, I became familiar with AQ, and I wound up facilitating 14 um, courses for, for AQ, five at my institution and nine externally. So I'm going to share with you my experiences as it relates to AQ and the um, what you will encounter as it relates to coming from a facilitator, but also as a faculty member. My role at AQ is an academic strategy consultant. So I kind of chair, I share that academic perspective um, with you and, and connect to you as it relates to faculty to faculty. So um, moving along, I'm gonna admit somebody else there. And I believe everybody can see my screen. So I just wanna say that our mission, perfect, thank you, Glenn. Our mission, I know, is one that we share with your institution, and that is to ensure student success and equity through quality instruction. 
And the course that AQ has created provides that opportunity for faculty. It provides an opportunity for us to go ahead and enhance the skill set and the knowledge base that we already have to go ahead and support students to success in the classroom. So a really exciting opportunity for us and an exciting opportunity for you at Bowling Green. So your course that you have that you will be able to participate um, includes 25 modules and the full course is broken down then into four different sections. So you see the four different blocks in front of you. The arrow that I am pointing to is just to give you a heads up that I'm going to jump in. My the presentation here is kind of short and then I'm going to jump into the course to give you an opportunity to see what the course looks like so you understand exactly what it is that you would be um, registering for and what it is that you are committing to. So I'm going to show you a module in the Promoting Active Learning um, block today. Um, as you look at the screen in front of you, you can see the 25 different um, modules or competencies in front of you, each one represented by a bullet underneath each one of those blocks. These practices or these modules or competencies have been research based and have um, been proven to impact student success. They are particularly helpful with students who are first time in college, first time, um, first generation students, but they are really helpful for all students. Um, students who have not been exposed to these types of teaching practices will really benefit from these opportunities. The practices and the um, competencies that you will go ahead and engage with are not level specific or discipline specific. They cover all areas in our good teaching practice. So oftentimes I have faculty say to me, oh, is it for math? Is it for science? And I can assure you it is for everyone. Um, and it doesn't matter if it is a graduate course or if it is an undergraduate course, we have individuals from all levels going ahead and engaging with the course experience. So your opportunity that you're looking at in front of you is also going to be focused on our course that is face-to-face -face instruction. So it's in that classroom instruction. So each one of these blocks has a number of components to it. And I wanna go ahead and switch to tell you a little bit about the design of the course so that you understand what it is that you're going to experience as you go through each one of the modules. So our course, um, was created for faculty and we sought the impact or we reached out to have the input from faculty across the country and to tell us what really would make for a rich robust learning opportunity and they said that they wanted it modularized that was really important to them and the next piece was they wanted it to be high quality and video rich and I really kind of wanted to touch base on that and this kind of why I segued into this slide is because for course takers, they said, it's really important for us to see demonstrations of practices being implemented in the classroom. So while I said your course is face-to-face, -face, you will see it is taken online, but it is going to show you demonstrations in a face-to-face -face environment. So we offer two different versions of this course, of course, and your course is going to be focused on that face-to-face -face environment. Um, so they wanted to see faculty from different institutions. They wanted to hear their voices. They wanted to hear and see them implementing practices. They wanted to see faculty from different disciplines, not just all English or humanities or sciences. They wanted to see a variety of different um, discipline experts sharing their practices. And they also said it was important to hear the voices of students. So when I hop into the course, I'm gonna show you those demonstration videos so you can see that high quality video rich content. And you can see a mix of individuals from um, different disciplines. And in this case, you'll see um, two individuals from one institution that are sharing in this particular module. Um, it is collaborative in the sense that while it is asynchronous and um, as course takers, as you engage in it, if Holly wants to engage in the course at two o'clock in the afternoon um, and Hans wants to go ahead and engage in it at 2 a.m. in the morning, um, you have that opportunity to engage with the course experience when it works for you. Um, if you want to go ahead and uh, talk about um, that collaborative cohort experience, that collaboration really comes together because you create a common language as an institution and with your cohort. You also create a collaborative cohort because one element of the, um, the course experience is an online discussion forum. So you come together in that area to go ahead and have a, a, a collaborative opportunity to engage with and learn from each other. Um, that is the, for me, 
Um, that is my favorite part of the course. A lot of times faculty tell me their favorite part of the videos, but I love that online discussion forum where I get to hear from my colleagues from different um, disciplines and the perspective that they're looking at something. It is facilitated by individuals on your campus. As you heard, Chelsea is going to be one of your facilitators. Your facilitator serves as your guide on the side, your mentor, um, and kind of your coach as you engage with the course experience. Um, and as your facilitators from your institution, they really have their finger on the pulse of what's going on at your institution and can speak more closely to what are related to strategic initiatives at your institution and supporting you and your students. Um, we have as well, one of the other pieces that faculty said would be really important is that they wanted to implement practices in the classroom. Um, I might raise some anxiety levels because you have to write a, re a reflection, but when I hop into the course, I'm going to show you a template that uh, shows you how easy it is to complete that re um, reflection because it is a template and I encourage all course takers to use uh, a template to make the response. Like a job. Yeah. I have a question. Hello. Uh, yes, do I have a question? Yeah. No, I just joined, so I'm going to mute myself now. Perfect, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so you have an opportunity to um, write that reflection and um, you, you implement a practice in the classroom, you write a reflection and then you identify how you're going to refine it. And that's all part of the reflection. Each of those 25 modules, you're asked to go ahead and implement a practice in the classroom. And once we get into the course, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And last but not least, your course is evaluated um, with those reflections by an AQ national reader. So it was really important for course takers to say, hey, I want that facilitator to be one person and I want the, the, the reader who's looking at my reflection to be a different person. So those two individuals are separate and the national reader is the one who's actually looking at your reflections and responding to if you met the criteria or not for the reflection. Sorry, I have a question. I'm sorry I joined in late. Yes. So I'm a graduate. I wanted to find out if a graduate student can actually take this training because I'm a graduate student and an international student. I'm going to go ahead and refer to um, Glenn to, to go ahead and answer that question I, I, as it relates to um, if you are able to go ahead and take the course. Yeah, thanks so much for joining Esther. At this time, the opportunity is not available for graduate student instructors, I'm sorry to say, but we, I'm, I'm happy that you, you're, you're more than welcome to stay here today. And then I'm going to ask Chelsea, I know that Chelsea Chandler um, over in our Center for Faculty Excellence is designing um, a, a comprehensive program for graduate student instructors as well. So maybe Chelsea, if you want to talk just really briefly about that opportunity. Hi, yes, Esther. I'm glad you're interested. Um, I'm going to send you the link in the chat here to the CFE website. Um, we are currently working with uh, Graduate Student Senate to design um, uh, programming specifically for graduate student teaching assistants. Um, but in the meantime, we do have a variety of workshops that we offer. And we do have a workshop coming up next week for Introduction to Canvas specifically designed for graduate students. Um, and all of that information is on the CFE website if you're interested. Um, and please uh, you know, check your email for updates from uh, Graduate Student Senate about further opportunities. Yeah. All right, that's fine. Perfect, thank you. Um, and I apologize, I was juggling my screens around because I realized I missed the screen. Um, one other piece that, of course, um, those individuals that participated in our focus groups indicated was they wanted something to be, um, they wanted a certificate and they wanted to be recognized for the work that they, they did. So you, upon completion of all 25 modules, successful completion will receive um, a certification um, that is endorsed by AQ and the ACE, the American Council on Education, um, for cer a certificate in effective college instruction. It is the only one that is endorsed by ASIN in higher education, so we are extremely proud of that. So another little piece that you can add to your um, CV. And I believe, I just wanted to make sure I saw some chat things going up. I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything. It was me, Jody. <laughs> All right. Um, the next slide here that I just want to, want to share with you um, really is an opportunity for you to kind of read some things here that other people are saying and faculty who've engaged in the course are saying about the opportunity to, to engage. So I'm going to stop for about 15 seconds and allow you to read what, um, whatever grabs you.
So hopefully you had a chance to read a couple of those. Um, I want to just comment on this one right here that says, you don't know what you know that will help you improve your teaching. And um, this really is coming from the perspective of whether you're new to teaching or you've been around for 25 years like myself or longer, you don't know what you don't know and it will help you to improve you. I also love that this person reflects on um, being put into a community of teaching to reflect on practices. Um, the last thing that I want to share with you is kind of the breakdown of your opportunity that you'll have at Bowling Green and what this is going to look like over the course of the next year. So it's 25 modules. Um, again, it's asynchronous, so you get to work on it when it works best for you. Um, it opens um, at different times based upon the different blocks. You will complete two blocks in the spring term and then two blocks in the fall term. So if you take a look at the screen in front of you, we have an opening date of um, February 14th, but your course doesn't start until February 21st. The final module in that section is, section is due on April 17th. You'll notice there is a break week embedded in there in that first block. And then in the second block, you have from 422 through 522, and then you have your summer break. So you're exposed to modules during that time period, about one per week, and asked to go ahead and select a practice to implement in the classroom. And then you have that break. If perchance you fall a little behind, you have summer if you wish to, to go ahead and maybe catch up on a module. But um, the best thing to do is to kind of stay on path with each module each week and implement those practices. During the course of the full 25 modules, it's about three hours of work a week. Um, I'm gonna hop into the course here in a minute so you can go ahead and see a little bit of the course. So you can understand what is expected, but just kind of those last three blocks, just so you see, um, your semester, you won't start back until later in August, but if anyone wants access to the course or this block in particular, it will open on August 10th. We have a break week embedded in there for you. And then your last one is going to go ahead and um, finish out the term and you'll finish um, uh, just after Thanksgiving with a break at Thanksgiving time. I'm gonna stop sharing that screen and I'm going to hop in the course. But as I shift into the course, I just wanna make sure if there are any questions, please um, go ahead and unmute yourself or raise a hand as I go ahead and grab my, my other screen. Yes, I have a question. Yes. Um, that, that block two timing, uh, that I think starts around our final exam week and into summer. So how would we implement practices? Great question. And, and I, have, I apologize. So you have access to the course, it opens up earlier. So you have access to go ahead and work ahead if you want. So you'll see oh. that you have those open dates, you have an opportunity, a great opportunity to work ahead and maybe have a little bit of an extra break before you actually lead into the summer. And if there's something that you're maybe, maybe a module that you're not able to implement something in, we actually have, and you're permitted to, to, to submit five plan to implement. So that might be one of the modules where you go ahead and do a plan to implement, where you're thinking about moving forward in the fall as to how you would implement a practice in, in, this, um, in the fall semester. Um, I encourage you, if you can though, to work ahead. Were there any other questions? I apologize. Give it a second here. And, okay. Let me go ahead and grab my other screen. And so I apologize, I'm having a... Went ahead and shared the volume. So hopefully you'll be able to um, hear this, but somebody will let me know as soon as we get started. So I've hopped in the course here to kind of give you an opportunity to see what it looks like and um, understand the experience that you have and what is expected of you. Um, I am in our course um, view as a student, um, and this is a demonstration model. Um, and what I'd like to do is point out before I hop into this, that our course has also gone through the QM um, Quality Matters rubric. So you will not only be exposed to pedagogically sound practices to implement in the classroom, you're also going to see a quality matters framework. So consistency and what is important to our students in the classroom, we recognize import is important to all course takers. So you'll notice that we have a quality matters um, framework as you engage with the course. So there's always going to be a start here module. And once you get into the course and you go through one 
module, you will recognize that all of the modules have that same exact flow. Um, so what I'm saying when I, when I say that is that every module is going to have an engagement piece. Every module will have a listen, watch, and learn section, a deep in thinking, and a practice and reflect, and a close strong. So you'll see consistency as you engage with the course. So I want to go ahead and put you through this. And our, our course lives in Canvas. So if you participate, you will receive an invitation in Canvas, and you'll go ahead and create an account there. Um, our course always begins with an introduction to kind of wrap our heads around what does this mean to go ahead and plan an effective classroom discussion for our students? What does it look like? So I'm going to go ahead and share this video. Our videos are always closed caption and you are timestamped so you have an idea of how long it's going to take. Welcome to the AQ module can on planning work? effective class discussions. In this module, you'll learn how to create thought-provoking questions. Great discussions happen because the faculty member structured the situation to facilitate that discussion happening. Ensure student participation. I ask my students to prepare the questions in advance of class because that allows them to talk about the things that they find most interesting or most intriguing in the readings that they have done. And increase student-to-student -student interaction. Being able to talk with my peers instead of just being talked at in a lecture is very valuable to me because I can test my viewpoints against like other people. Let's begin. So you have an introduction to the course and you get to go ahead and hear a little bit about that. Um, there's always a transcript to download for the videos. On the bottom of our screens, we always have a previous and a next slide. So on our next page, we also we are always going to ask you some opening questions. Um, and it's not really a quiz as to what you know, it's kind of a, uh, a question related to how does this relate to me and my classroom? So for example, you will see in this case, and there's anywhere from two to four questions. First question here is in a typical class about how many of your students come to class prepared to participate in discussions. Um, next one is in your experiences, what motivates students to participate in discussions? And the last one says, which of these strategies for increasing student participation do students respond to most positively? So I wanna go ahead and I wanna come back to this first question. And I wanna kind of feel the pulse of the room and those of you who are on the call, um, so just kind of to engage you here um, through the use of the chat, um, in a typical class about how many of your students come to class prepared to participate in discussion, um, would you say almost all, three-fourths, half, one-fourth, or very few students come prepared to engage in discussions? And if you can just put that in the chat, and I'm going to watch the chat. Amy, this is three-fourths, three-fourths. And I'm, I'm gonna bring that typical teacher in me. I see two people responded, okay. Good, we, this is great. And it, Joanne is giving me an 80%. So a lot of you are saying about three fourths of your students come prepared to go ahead and engage in these conversation. So, which obviously means that about one fourth of them are not. Um, and I don't know if you're like me, but then it, I'm, I'm the one who is in the classroom trying to figure out how can I get these other quarter of my students to go ahead and engage in these conversations and, and to be prepared to discuss with us. So you will learn about some of those strategies and practices that you can implement in the classroom in this module. So once you complete the questionnaire, you will submit it. I'm a bad student. I didn't answer all of them. Um, but one of the nice things about um, the questionnaire is once you've completed the questionnaire, you will see the responses from your colleagues. You do not receive, you do not see that Esther indicated X and that Lee indicated Y and Holly said whatever else, you see a, an aggregate. So you get to see who was saying three-fourths. You you'll get to see, uh, I'm sorry, not who, you'll get to see how many will say three-fourths and you'll get to say very, see who says very few or how many say very few. So it gives you an idea of what are your colleagues at your institution seeing in their classrooms as it relates to being prepared. The next portion of the course is our learning objectives. Our learning objectives are always going to begin with a rationale. So when you look at our rationale here, we also have what we're citing here is Howard. And if you wanna dig a little bit deeper into it as to why um, we feel that this is so important to be prepared to have those effective classroom discussions, you can dig a little bit deeper there. There's some other information and resources in the course, but that's um, one little point, place where we point you out to as it relates to the rationale. 
Our learning objectives in this module include four different objectives. As I indicated earlier, we ask you course takers to implement a practice in your classroom each week that you're exposed to one of these modules. When I say implement a practice, I'm talking about these little bullets that are here. So in this case, this module has four objectives, but it has 10 different practices that you can implement in the classroom. Sometimes I have instructors who say, Jody, I'm gonna implement a number of these. And the idea is that you implement one. Um, and that idea is that you implement something that's new to you um, or something that you learned more about. Oftentimes I would have instructors come to me and say, hey, Jody, I'm really familiar with Um, and I say, okay, then find um, an, a practice that you learned more about and implement that practice in the classroom. The idea is we want to use things that are newer to us, um, brand new to us, so that we're learning more about because we want to shift the needle in the classroom. And if we're using something we've already done in the classroom, it's not going to have that impact. So in this case, we're looking at four different objectives and preparing students for those classroom discussions. One of the pieces that is always included in the course is a skeleton outline that gives you an opportunity to go ahead and engage with the course as you take it. I always encourage course takers to go ahead and print this off and to engage with it. Um, I have one um, facilitator at one institution that she says she loves this because she says it's her cheat sheet. And she said when she gets to the piece where she needs to write a reflection, she has all of her information because she engaged in the course on the skeletal outline. So I encourage you to go ahead and pull this off. And it's got empty spots for you to go ahead and add information that's pertinent to you, that's critical or makes you kind of think about different things as you engage with the course experience. Um, our next portion of the course is always going to be our demonstration videos. Sometimes the demonstration videos are all on the same screen and you can just click on any of the, the different demonstration videos. Um, we ask you to go, it's great to go ahead and view all of the demonstration videos, but I understand and we understand how busy a faculty member's schedule is um, with the teaching, the research and grading and everything that you might not be able to watch all of the videos. So one of the things that I um, encourage course takers to do is to find the objective that speaks to them and find the demonstration video that coincides with that and to watch that video and to use that to help them to write their reflection. So in this case, the videos are not all on the same screen. They're on multiple screens. So I'm going to go ahead and move to our second set of videos here. And in this case, it's a fishbowl discussion. And this is one of my favorite um, videos and opportunities to go ahead and engage students in the classroom. Um, so I want to share a little clip of this. And again, the idea is that you use a video, you watch a video that's going to help you to be successful with writing your uh, reflection and implementing a practice in the classroom. You have access to the course content for a full year after the course ends. Um, so you can get back into the course and review anything that you might have missed if you didn't have time to view all the videos. So in this case, I'm going to go to, I believe it's my three minute mark um, right here, and we're going to get started start. Allie, the random selection of people to be in the fishbowl is a key aspect of the fishbowl because everybody has to be prepared to answer any question. Dan. All right, so you have 20 minutes to discuss the articles. Begin when you are ready. The most important thing about positioning the students for the fishbowl is that you have a small group in the middle that are sitting and looking at each other. So this format works best when it's a close-knit conversation amongst four students. So I thought all of these articles were really interesting. Because there's a, the debate we need to learn about in Ward whether faces are special or not. So that kind of makes me wonder whether faces are different if there's a disorder that specifically makes you not be able to identify faces. It could be something about the organization of facial features. So it could be autosomal dominant, and that would be reflected in the fact that so many of the family members have it. It definitely motivates me to do the reading just because, I mean, if you're not prepared, it definitely shows. I can imagine walking into class for one of these discussions and having not done the reading. You just wouldn't know what to say and kind of sit there in silence, and that can just be painful. If there comes a point in the conversation where nobody is saying anything, they can sit there and look at each other for 20 minutes. And that's often when those quieter students will chime in. A lot of the more active students have made their points and have slowed down a little bit. And then those quieter students can jump in and make their points. Everyone in the family had it, but it was some, somewhat of a spectrum where some people were really um, had severe prosopagnosia, 
where they couldn't recognize themselves in the mirror, mm-hmm. whereas mm-hmm. some had trouble if someone got a haircut. That is yeah. a really big difference. Yeah. I think one of the most beneficial parts to having these group discussions and not having the teacher be involved is that you really get to build a sense of community within the class which just makes it more fun. You're getting to work with other people your age, your peers, and are kind of growing and developing together as opposed to just having someone spit information at you. But those are different parts of the brain, too. We sort of bring in the amygdala and the insula and things like that, basal ganglia for anger. Um, Okay, I'm going to stop you guys there. That was a great first fishbowl. So we're going to take a... Jody, I'm not hearing you. There you Sorry, go. I just saw I wasn't on, I was on mute. So you get an opportunity. That was just a clip of it to see the instructor kind of talking about it, how it works. Um, and then you get to see the students kind of working in this um, fishbowl environment and what it looks like. And, and you hear the students and how important it is to them and the recognition that they need to come to class prepared. Um, this is just one example. Um, so I just want to give you a, a glimpse as to what it would look like. And then we have always in our courses, expert insights. Um, And these are provided um, possibly as a um, a, a podcast or an interview back and forth, or in this case, it's something we call um, a speed drawing. So you will hear it being narrated, but then you'll also hear, in this case, Jay Howard um, popping in and out and kind of sharing some different pieces as it relates to planning that effective class. I'm gonna play a, a short snip from this as well. Great discussions don't just happen. Great discussions are made to happen by instructors who understand that discussions take planning. It is a myth that great discussions happen spontaneously. Great discussions happen because the faculty member structured the situation to facilitate that discussion happening. Yes, occasionally there are times, there are events when, you know, serendipity strikes and you have a great discussion without really planning it. But you're much more likely to be successful in having a deep, meaty, thorough discussion that looks at an issue from multiple angles and multiple perspectives if you, as the instructor, have structured the situation to facilitate that happening. So you get to hear from the expert kind of sharing their perspective as it relates to the importance of planning that effective classroom. And moving on in our course, our next portion of the course is going to be our implementation resources. So as I indicated earlier, your course offering is focused on a face-to-face environment. So that's why you saw that instructor in the actual classroom. You heard the students and you saw the students in the classroom engaging in that practice as it related to the fishbowl. Um, So all of your practices are going to be right here and they're automatically defaulting to um, practices and handouts that you can use in the face-to-face environment. Um, You just click on it and download it, and there it is. It's a a, a step-by-step kind of handout for you to go ahead and kind of guide you through what this practice would be like and how you would implement it in the classroom. Um, Additionally, it provides you an opportunity when you print it off to make your own little notes as to how you might tweak it for your classroom. If you are somebody who is teaching an online class and you want to try something out in an online class or in a hybrid class, you simply click on this middle tab here and it provides you access to those same resources and they've been modified for an online environment if you choose to use it in an online classroom. Um, And then we have additional resources as I indicated earlier for further reading related to this particular topic. You will see those implementation resources for your course um, at another spot when it requires you to identify what you're going to implement in the classroom and write your reflection. So I'll show you that in a minute. The next portion of the course is uh, a challenge and a misconception section. Um, So you will notice there are anywhere from two to six questions generally in the challenges and misconceptions section. And I like to say for this portion of the course, whether you've been teaching for 25 years or 30 or new, um, I think we all have challenges and misconceptions. And this is an opportunity for us to go ahead and um, Um, dig deeper and think a little bit more about these different um, misconceptions or challenges. And you'll see there's clarification. And then you'll also see that we provide suggestions for individuals when it relates to a challenge. Um, So 
This portion of the course also gives you an opportunity to go ahead and uh, engage with the course and share with us your feedback. So I'm going to ask you right now to share with me. Um, for question four, it says this is a challenge, um, possibly. Students do not feel obligated to interact with their peers during discussions. Um, is that an encounter you have in chain? Uh, you have, um, have bleh, is that how you encounter this challenge? Yes or no? If you could give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a yes or no, if that is something that you have experienced in your classroom. I know that I personally did. John, Glenn is saying yes, he's, he's giving me a thumbs up. I see that. And Chelsea's shaking her head. Um, if anybody else wants to put something in the chat, um, that would be great. I'm looking to see what kind of responses. Yeah, so weak responses to other, yeah. And then um, I love that, Patricia, because for me, then I'm, I'm trying to go ahead and create the question to dig a little bit deeper with the students and get them to go ahead and have more robust conversation. So thank you for sharing. And I see, yes, Hans is saying, yes, yes. So great. Um, Amy's saying not usually a challenge, but she has small classes. So I agree, that does help, Amy, it really does. Um, and then they really kind of know each other and feel comfortable. So um, thank you for responding there. I saw a few responses and I saw some head shakes and so forth. The next portion of the course is my favorite portion of the course. And this is the observe and analyze. Um, this is an opportunity for you to engage with the course and your colleagues in this open discussion forum. Um, what you see here is generally either going to be a textual exchange between an instructor and students, or you're going to see a video um, where we have what we call a practice in a developing stage. So based upon everything you've learned at this point as it relates to those um, engaging discussions in the classroom, um, we're going to show a demonstration where we have an instructor in a safe environment um, where we can come together and kind of critique it and give some feedback as to what we recognize now are some things that we can implement, but also more importantly, and what I really love is an opportunity for you to kind of share what it is you're doing in the classroom. Um, we always provide a prompt. In this case, the prompt says, what are practices that Paulette used to encourage or discourage student participation? What te techniques have you found most helpful in preparing students to fully engage in this class discussion? So you get to go ahead and come down here and you get to share your responses. Um, we ask you to go ahead and write a, re a reply, and we also ask you to engage with your colleagues. Um, you also have an opportunity to like a comment if you wanna just like a comment. But for this portion of the course, this is where I felt there was this really rich, deep conversation with my colleagues. Um, I learned so much, and I will tell you the one, um, the one section I facilitated, I believe nine different times, um, I learned something new every single time that I facilitated that course because you're always hearing from different perspectives, from different disciplines, and, and our minds are, are different in how we look at things. And it's so funny how many times people would say, oh, I watched the video and I never even noticed that. Um, but an opportunity to say, geez, I didn't even think about that. That's something I really need to think about. Um, the other thing that's great in this area is this is where you can actually pose some questions to your colleagues and say, hey, I teach math or I teach you know, accounting. Um, is there an idea that somebody might have to share as to how I could actively engage students in these discussions, something that you think I could work on or something that you've practiced in your classroom? I've also had faculty who have asked colleagues if they can, after they've shared something, if they can come into their classroom to go ahead and see how they implement a practice. Um, you'll also notice sometimes colleagues will say, hey, I've created this file and somebody else will say, can you share it with me? So, and I'm always wanting to be smarter, not work harder or work smarter, not harder. Um, what do you have that I can borrow? Um, and, you know, asking a colleague, can you share that with me? I, I'd love to go ahead and use that and then tweak it how you need to tweak it. Um, I will tell you that I actually had um, my last course that I facilitated, I actually had two faculty members from completely different disciplines who came together and co-taught. So that was really kind of exciting. And again, you get to hear those different perspectives because I oftentimes would say, okay, I'm like of the English or the reading or the education mindset. And I, I think one way, but it's really great to hear from somebody who teaches math or um, science or some different subject that's not my area and how they're thinking and processing something. So I love this portion of the course. Um, again, a lot of people love the videos. I love the observe and analyze session where I can interact with my colleagues and hear some different things. This is the most important part of the course. So re your re written reflection and your implementation of a practice in the classroom. So again, you can see we have all four objectives um, and you have those practices right here. 
So we have those resources right here for you to download. Um, and as you look at each one of them, um, you might have a resource that's specific to one in particular, and you would click on that one. Um, and really kind of there to support you and guide you as you write your reflection. So we have all four of the practices. And I wanna kind of move down here and take a look at the reflection and the rubric that you have. So your reflection and your rubric is gonna ask you to meet three criteria. You always have to write to meet the criteria. So the middle column, you don't get a different score if you meet versus exceeds. It's you either, you're meeting it or you're not. So um, if it's exceed, great. Oftentimes I have faculty who would say to me, Jody, I have to exceed, I have to exceed. And I say, okay, well then you have to write to exceed. Um, but um, I wanna pull up a, a template of the um, rubric that you can use to go ahead and just write right in it to respond to these questions. So I'm gonna leave the student video because for some reason I'm not able to access it. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab the reflection guide and pull it up right here for you to say. So in this case, um, this is actually combined reflection. So this is a case where two modules are coming together and you're writing a single reflection for this one. And it's asking you to respond to what practice did you implement from planning and effective discussions? And I'm sorry, I think I might not be zoomed in far enough for you guys. So let me go ahead and do that. So what practice did you implement from the planning effective discussion? And I'm asking you to go ahead and to meet the criteria you have to either explain why you selected it or thoroughly describe the steps that you took. Um, you're then asking um, to uh, what practice did you implement from the facilitate or what practice did you implement from the facilitating and engaging discussion? So it's one or the other. And then we ask you, how did your use of practices go ahead and impact your students in the classroom? If you want to exceed the criteria, by the way, it's always writing to the optional piece, but for meeting the criteria, you're always just responding to this question, share how your use of these practices impacted your students. So what's really important as far as um, I, I look at this is that you, you write to answer the question. And if that can be done in a matter of sentences or a matter of bullets, however it is that you, you like to write, that's how you need to write. I oftentimes have people say to me, is this three paragraphs? Is this three pages? Um, right to answer the question. And the final question you're asked is what steps will you take to continue to refine your practices? Because as we look at teaching, it's always about refining our practices to support students for success and what it is that we can do to enhance or improve our skills that we have. Once you submit that, you will hear from your national reader. Um, they will respond as to whether you met the criteria or not, and they'll go ahead and give you feedback. If you didn't, they're gonna go ahead and tell you exactly what was missing and you have an opportunity to resubmit. Our goal is for everybody to successfully submit reflections. So if you miss something, they'll tell you exactly what it was and they'll send it back to you and you'll have an opportunity to resubmit. Um, that doesn't happen too often, just so you know, um, uh, especially if you're using that reflection guide. Um, one of the final pieces here at the end of the course is a reflection survey. The reflection survey is gonna ask you, um, what you learned that was brand new, what you learned more about. And we're just asking you for your feedback on those 10 different practices that you were exposed to in this module. And then we ask you about what you implemented and what you plan to implement. Your items that you identify that you plan to implement will come up on your note to your future self. So we kind of close out with an opportunity for you to write a note to your future self. Um, and in that note to future self, it's really important to kind of think about what did I learn in here that is going to support me moving forward? Or what did I learn that I implemented this week that um, maybe doesn't work for me, maybe didn't work this week in the semester? So you're exposed to modules um, at specific weeks during the course of the semester, and you might find that you have a module and you're like, oh my God, I love all the practices in here, but it's really hard for me to make this work this week. Find the one that works best for you that week with your curriculum, but you might say, oh my God, these would work great at week seven in the semester and I have all these other things that I could connect it to. If that's the case, make a note to yourself right here when you write your note to your future self and then you actually will see that later on. And it will also pull up everything that you've identified that you plan to implement moving forward. You'll notice here, it says you get to view your cohort's responses. That's not for, you get to view your own responses. Your cohort responses are available to be seen. And I will tell you as a facilitator, I look at these and I love them because I actually saw one um, course taker indicated, um, she made a note to herself and she said, 
you will be at week 10 when you're reviewing this and you need to remember to do, and she identified these things that she needed to remember to do at week 10 related to that module that she learned about. So it's a great opportunity to kind of trigger something for yourself at a later point in time. And our last portion of this course is going to go ahead and be the references. Why am I not able to move the screen? I apologize. There we go. We end with our references. So you get to see where all those individuals in this module were from. So we have people from University of Arizona, Michigan, Butler, um, and from a variety of different uh, disciplines that we're presenting in this um, module. And then we have additional resources, our references at the bottom for anybody who wants to dig a little bit deeper. Um, we try to point out wherever we can, but if we can't, I always tell folks to go ahead and reach out to the wonderful librarians. They will be glad to go ahead and assist you. Um, and that is it for me. That is our course experience. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if there are any questions. We know what some of the most frequently asked questions are. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of the most frequently asked questions are, you know, the duration, and I shared the duration with you, yeah. you'll have access to the course content for a full year after um, you finish the, the course. Um, it's about three hours of um, work a week, um, depending on the practice you, you pick and that you implement in the classroom, it may be a little bit more, it may be a little bit less. Um, some folks decide they want to do multiple practices, so that's obviously going to be a little bit longer. Um, but it is a great opportunity to, to work with your colleagues and hear um, different perspectives as to how you can support students to success. And then I, I think I indicated this earlier, it is not level or um, discipline specific, it is just good teaching practice. Oh, we got a great question in the chat. I see that. So. I, I'm going to go ahead and I'll, I'll answer that, but Chelsea and uh, Glenn, do you want to go ahead and did you want to respond to, to that first? And then I can kind of add anything in um, as it relates to um, Donna saying all of her classes are online this semester. Would she still be able to complete the course? Sure. That We, we know that we have um, instructors who are teaching all completely in person. Some were teaching completely blended, some a mixture of in-person and online or fully online or remote, as you indicated, Dawn, as well. So we absolutely intend this to be um, available to faculty, regardless of the, the modes in which they are teaching. And I think I would ask um, Jody, I know that you indicated that one tab that sort of translated some of the information from an in-person to uh, an online. Is that throughout the course? Those yes, it is. And I'm going to go back to that because I think Really important. I always try to go ahead and um, go back to that and actually. And yeah, let me let me also add that you know this this course takes you know it, it, it's over the span of twenty five weeks. So as you can imagine, we had dozens, if not over a hundred cohorts in play um, in the academic year uh, twenty nineteen into twenty twenty. So when the pandemic hit, we had countless cohorts across the country who were engaged in this course who suddenly had to pivot online with no warning. And the feedback we got from them was that not only was the course content itself a tremendous help in thinking about how to translate these practices online, but also the support and camaraderie that faculty got from being in that cohort was incredibly supportive during that time as well. And I'm, I'm going to share my screen again because I just want to make sure I point that out. So we and Marianne, um, what she pointed to, my institution was one of those institutions <laughs> that were doing that face to face, and we shifted to that online. So I was constantly saying to faculty, "Okay, go here, look for the in, an online instructional resources tab," um, because we were that face to face environment. We automatically defaulted to here. So if you click on that middle tab, you're going to find those resources. The other thing that I want to encourage you to do, Don, is if you're thinking about it and you want feedback from a colleague, just say, hey, I'm doing this online. Does anybody have a suggestion? Is anybody doing something different? And see what they have to share. So I do want to, I did want to just kind of point that out again. 
And then I, I have a related question. I know that many of our faculty teaching in person are doing so in spaces or in um, with, with restrictions around masks, around some distancing in some contexts. And I know that uh, clearly these videos were created at a time pre-COVID. Uh, we may never get back to that time exactly. So is that something that, that you recommend that we focus on in the discussions, for example, like how are we sort of adapting this, not just it isn't simply in person or online, but it might be a kind of how are we helping to facilitate a discussion in a room where not all students may be able to get close to each other or be able to uh, hear from the back of the room, something like that. I'm not sure if any of our instructors, if that's if that resonates. Glenn, and I would say absolutely in that online discussion forum, that is where, again, I, that was my favorite part. I swear it was the richest part where you could go ahead and bounce around ideas and ask colleagues like, hey, um, what are you doing in your classroom? I mean, what is the, the masking, you know, like in your classroom? How are you spacing students and what kind of interactions are you having? Do you have any, do you have any suggestions? Um, so I definitely think that that online discussion forum is an opportunity for faculty to pose questions to each other. Um, and then maybe kind of um, an opportunity for a, the facilitator to kind of wrap it up and say, hey, in a nutshell, these were some great suggestions that we heard as it related to, you know, the, the, new, the new normal that we're in. And I'll stop there because I see Chelsea's got her hand and is ready to comment. Yeah, thanks, Jody. Um, I I just have a another additional question that I think might be pertinent to to everyone here. Um, so we know that the cohort starts on February twenty first, which isn't actually the beginning of the semester, and so the start of the uh, the the course with the modules begins with like, you know, the icebreaker and a couple of those beginning of the course activities and just wondering how um, participants are going to implement some of those practices if they're not at the beginning of the semester. So just kind of thinking through that. Um, and, I, and I know that this will probably come up in a few of the different, uh, a few of the other blocks as well, where since we're not lined up with the, the actual academic year, this might come up um, throughout the, the course. Another great question, Chelsea. Thanks for asking that. So yes, yeah, so your your course starts with um, that um, first day of class and leading the first day of class and what's important to you know to have a, a strong class at the beginning of semester. So a couple of things that I can share on that um, side. If you have um, different starting courses, so if somebody um, has a schedule, like if you're not all 16 weeks and you do eight week, eight week or 10, there might be a course that might be starting later that maybe that's a practice you could go ahead and implement in a course that might be starting in a week or two. And maybe um, you, you submit one of your implementation, uh, your plan to implement practices there. So you get a total of five plan to implement versus implementing a practice. So anybody who doesn't have that first week opportunity to go ahead and create that video or do something for that leading the first day of class, that's gonna be where you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and do a plan to implement reflection for your course takers. Again, you have five of them in all. Some of the other modules that you'll be exposed to in that first block, you're going to be able to find opportunities to go ahead and write in a reflection and implement a practice in the classroom. Does that help answer that question? Yes, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Well, that is my extended pause to see if there were any delayed questions and I don't think we have any. So I'm going to go ahead and ask one final question for you to share with uh, a little emoji or something. Um, how many of you will be signing up and registering to participate in this course offering? Um, you can go ahead and um, give me a little thumbs up or uh, a high five I see there. So awesome, I love it. Or a confetti, thank you, Amy. Um, so wonderful. Glad, if you have glad more to questions see. or need more information, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to, to answer any questions that we can and uh, really appreciate all your time and attention today. I know it's a very busy time of, of year. Yeah. Also, there's another information session next week. I think it's scheduled for the end of the week on Friday. So if you have any friends that you think would be interested in the course, tell them about it and um, let them know that next info session is next week. And I say phone a friend and bring them along with you. It's more fun <laughs> when there's a group of you. Yeah. Have a fabulous afternoon. Thank you for your time.
Thank you all. Take care.